Thank you, Doc. So, it was completely wrong. I'm not going to talk about anything disaster in tech. <laughs> so, if you want to leave, you can leave. This is going to be thinking. Uh, it's going to be the end of the day. I don't even know whether I'm going to finish in half an hour or in an hour. <laughs> like, the deck's new. The reasoning is not new. It's, a, it's my story. But I hope it makes you think about your situation, your company, your problems as well. So that's me. Um, I couldn't bring myself to paint myself as a horse <laughs> because I still feel like a donkey. Um, this is a story about five years ago. I joined a company that was having problems. And I was already five years into DevOps. And I said, like, how hard can it be, right? How hard can it be? Like, I've been patient zero, how I sometimes people refer to me. Starting it, like, learn so much stuff, saw, read, talked to so many people. How hard can it be? And it turns out very hard. But that's a spoiler, but not as you would probably not expect. So DevOps, you come into the company. I came in because they had like a performance issue uh, about a problem that spawned an unzip of a file every time a new unzip process started up, right? So it's very inefficient. We're talking about live production systems, live televisions, live shows, all that stuff. They were doing Git checkouts on production servers. There was no build pipeline, nothing of testing. I learned that testing in that sense worked differently. We were working on prototypes. Prototypes, it was more important to understand that we were building the right thing. And that was evolving all the time instead of it building it right. So we could get away with manual testing. Over time, we improved, we improved. I think the best we got was that we did during a live television show, a deploy in production during the show in two minutes because the producer on Slack said to us, please fix this percentage. I cannot explain to people that the jury percentage of 70 for the winner and the audience percentage of 50 is not 120%. And the engineer, of course, said percentage, they cannot go above 100%. So we fixed that live during production, had a lot of issues because our third party systems during the load testing, we had a lot of failures, but we managed. The company got confidence in us, we were doing it during a live show. The people were happy. The show was happy, and so on. This was only the start. So this is my DevOps, why I went in, performance issue. But we were working, as I mentioned, with suppliers, third-party systems that needed to work for us as well. It wasn't in the build pipeline. It was external to our company. Whether that's a service you use, that's a data source you use outside, it doesn't really matter. A SaaS, later we experimented with Lambda. And the first time we used Lambda, we got an error, disk full. We didn't get it, right? So we learned that instead of looking only inwards in our pipeline, that we had to work and see where our bottleneck was. And the bottleneck was not inside our authority. It was outside. It was the supplier. It was the cloud solution. It was the video encoding system. So we had to make friends with our suppliers. I learned over the years that I would send them on first use of a supplier, I would send them feedback from the first experience I had from the product. 
it even went that far that, uh, that we were one of the first users for the mobile uh, testing solution for Amazon that I learned that they later use our ticket to go up in the engineering, say, somebody's using our product. We need to fix this stuff. Because when I listed all the mobile devices, it had something like blah, blah, blah in the list of the string. So working with suppliers is very similar to working with your internal people. They are craving for input. They want to know what you want. And it's really hard to get honest, unbiased tech feedback. So this was our first step. I think at that time, I did a uh, talk at serverless conference. And I called it, it isn't about being serverless. It's about service full. We are relying on so many external services that we need to become friends with them. But at the same time, I was thinking, this is really strange. Like, we always said dev and ops need to work better together, get them in the same room, get them working to, you know, talking to each other. And then all of a sudden, your supplier just has an API. And it really felt like, is this the end of DevOps? We work with another company, we read the documentation, we work, we, we use the API, and there was no communication, no collaboration happening anymore. I found out over the, the course of time is that they are giving different cues on how they collaborate. One very good cue is that a lot of companies started doing is they write post-mortems of their failures and they make it public. For example, another uh, thing they did was falsely expose their internal errors of their systems to us so we could see that they were failing and it wasn't just our problems. So the whole idea is that if you look at DevOps started from system theory, looking at the bottleneck where it's an ox bottleneck, for us, suppliers were the next bottleneck and we started making friends with them. And that was being on the chat with them, making, seeing them at conferences. So there's a lot of different ways that you can become friends with them. And then I shared, I, I got shares from the company. I became company co-owner just by going in from a tech problem because the next problem was we didn't have enough users. So thinking again from the system perspective, I could have left and said like, yes, it's not a technology problem, I'm going away. But instead, I started working with marketing. And marketing, if you look at it as, usually they have like, they can sell people HTTPS ads, it's the next new thing. We often joked with the marketing person that she actually did that once at the job. Like, yeah, HTTPS. Like, but I found out that they can be your biggest supporter for new features. They promote that to the world. They tell everybody about it. So it gives you a sense of feedback that feeds back into operations. So they are an ally in your work as well. And I found that by writing some blog posts and some stuff we did internally, they could use that as marketing material and it opened a lot of doors. I wrote a, competitive, uh, a comparison article on all the video streaming solutions for real-time video streaming in the industry. All the vendors came to us because we were vendor neutral. They pointed to us. That was brilliant for marketing because now you had inbound leads, people pointing, and all those companies were pointing to us. So this is just an example on how the tech bottleneck moved into a marketing problem and how marketing was helping us and we were helping marketing as well. The stereotyping from dev and ops, you don't work with each other, it was still there. Like marketing folks, they talk about things that are magical and don't exist. If you sit down with them, feed them the right information, 
they can help you really well to set the correct tone in your company. The next one was, and I have to cheat, HR, right? So we grow, we need more people, but that was a real problem. Hiring people, we were this tiny company, three, four people uh, within Belgium. All the bigger companies were getting all the people. So how do I, we get them? So we went to local meetups to find people that we think were interesting. We wrote honest articles on our website how life was as we felt it. It wasn't about, like, this is what we're hiring for, like all the buzzwords or all, all the tech keywords. No, this is what the life is, like with good and bad, and we were very open about it. We didn't get people that had the exact technical skills as HR was typically searching for, but we found people with potential. We had some bad people in a way that it didn't much at the end, but we had good people where we saw potential. We improved our hiring mechanism in a way that um, it wasn't just having a few interviews and signing. We asked them over with the engineering team, spend some time, see whether that's compatible. Because uh, the, the engineers actually complained, why are you doing this hiring somewhere else? And we need to see whether they're compatible. So again, it shows you if you have the narrow mindset of dev and ops just working there together to try and fix the problem of the build pipeline, <clears throat> the problem is way bigger, and we can attribute way more to the organization than we think, and we can get information from them as well. Sales was hardest for us. When is this feature coming now? I want to sell this. And uh, they, they put so much pressure on us. Um, but then I realized they are having the same problems we are having internally as the engineering. Here's the backlog. What needs to be done first? Who gets the resources? And then the dreaded question, how long will it take to build it? The salespeople get the question. When can I have this feature? <laughs> How much will it cost? I cannot buy it from you. Can you do it cheaper? So they were all having the same problems. They even had the same problem being on call 24 hours, seven by seven, if you're at the small company. And they learned that they have to react as fast as possible. Speed was fundamental in having a good sales is that when it's on the mind of the customer who wants to buy something, at that time you have to really fit in and not an email after a week saying, yes, you know, let's schedule an appointment. So we use the same techniques as we organize ourselves internally. And um, we also explained to sales that um, when they sell something, could you please alter the contract in a way that we're going to have a prioritization discussion already, kind of in the contract, where it's about a number of days that are sold with this scope, and then we can negotiate the most important things. So it was already in the contract, instead of being too late, when it had to be delivered, to have that discussion. Because of the pricing discussion, we learned how to build simpler architectures. I plead guilty as an engineer to over-engineer stuff and not to do the simplest things possible. They pressured us and they were right because if they didn't do that and then didn't put the pressure on us, we would be losing customers because our price was too high. I also learned that they asked me, how much does it cost to have one customer? And then we put like a margin on there and then we know what our price is. It's really terrible to ask an engineer what things cost because he will build you like the ideal model, then put all the safety 
percentages in that calculation, <laughs> and then they put like a margin on top of it, you have to be open about the discussion, how it, the minimal thing is, what you can achieve, what it actually costing, instead of trying to defend yourself ahead about having the discussions later that it, you, know, you have to have some margin and, and uh, margin on margin on margin, you can't sell. So I was really grateful for that. At times I hated them, but I really appreciated that they were having the same struggle as we had. And once we moved, like, yeah, we can build it, there's people interested, they really helped us. Okay, can we sell it? And that collaboration really led me to think broader on DevOps, where to go where the bottleneck is. I mentioned about the estimates. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, we also found that documentation is a really selling point. Uh, we were coming in a B2B world where everything was like, you wanna see our documentation? Just give us money. It's like, no, this is not, like, I would shy away from a website, from a product, where I can't see the documentation up front before buying a product, right? It's all about getting that feedback cycle as fast as possible. So once we put all the documentation outside, all the, the things we could put outside, we saw an increase in our sales process as well. So again, the relationship on helping two silos typically thought of in an enterprise, how they can dance and, and improve stuff. And while we didn't, we weren't a big company, we found that our secret sauce, while being small, was that people came for the, uh, for the features, but they stayed for the support. So once we get them as fast as possible, like even of the first day, if we can get them on Slack, answer all their questions as fast as possible, take all their worries away, and then during production, even if things go f uh, wrong, you know, I had like a certificate expiring during a prime TV show. I had like DNS expiring <laughs> during a prime TV show. But it's how you fix it, how open you are about communicating it, not seeking the blame. You know, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. That mentality, that made our uh, customers stay. And then another ally, which I didn't expect, the legal department. Any people from legal here? Too bad. Legal, when the GDPR stuff came in there, I don't know how it was in your company, but the engineer started to think a lot more about security. <laughs> and um, also, we had a security incident, not like uh, exposure of data or something, but um, it was really nice that the way they wrote the contract, that it had our back in a good way. So that collaboration, instead of having the template uh, contract, like you have to be 100% secure, that's how these legal kind of things go, like anything you don't do is your fault, and, and then by reasoning and helping them to write that in a, like in a modern times, uh, what we could do, what we couldn't do, and be upfront on that. Even the contract was really helpful when somebody called up on an issue we had that we could say, well, you know, we're upfront about it, this is that. And this really helped having our back. And then finance, small startup, money, customers. Like, um, I didn't realize upfront how much I would worry about the money. Being a business owner, can we pay the people? How about the cash flow? Is it coming in? Um, and it also changed some of the decisions we made in the product. Like, we didn't care in the beginning about, about reporting. Like, who used what on the show? You know, servers are up or down. But, Finance said, like, okay, we need this billing, and it needs to go as fast as possible because we're going to have an issue with cash flow if we don't get the payments rolling quite soon. So, again, 
what something you wouldn't expect as thinking of DevOps in a small sense. But if you think more broader, where's your bottleneck in your company? It might not be because you tune the kernel to 2% more. If you're not having money, that's a bigger issue because the whole company might not exist anymore. So always think about where is your next bottleneck. And that's the mantra I've always used going into these companies uh, and think about the, the problem. And then I decided it's enough. Like I was working so many hours and um, at a certain point I thought like, we are compensating in engineering the fact that we aren't selling enough. Uh, doing the long hours, technology on a shoestring budget, and um, I learned about something that's called Hopium. Who has heard about Hopium? So Hopium is the drug when your salesperson says, I'm gonna sell like five customers the next quarter, and then it's gonna be the next quarter. <laughs> And the next, and then it's no money. So I decided to end the company. I will say that we tried everything we could on a collaboration perspective of having all these groups work together. I think I went broad enough as some would say like biz, dev, sec, whatever ops, but still, our biggest bottleneck is that there wasn't a market fit. Later, I think a week ago, I saw, no, we started actually talking to companies that could uh, buy us, and I found out everybody in the field was struggling with the same thing. Everybody wanted to do it, but it didn't bring enough money. And we were thinking like, yes, we're doing it wrong, <laughs> because the others are doing it, and they have customers, and they were like, 10 times the size we had, uh, but secretly they were doing other stuff, <laughs> hoping this would take off, but they already moved here. And we were focusing so much on here. So it's something you, know, you don't usually talk about. Everybody's fired from your company and you wanna sell your software. That's an interesting period to be in your company because as the busy in the you feel responsible. So when the news was said into the company, everybody had this down feeling. Yeah, you know, everybody's looking for a new job. And at that time, I was looking into the concept of uh, mob programming. We spent three days of writing documentation, so not even code, writing documentation for the next company. And we had so much fun. And it was insane. Everybody could just say, oh, I've worked here for four years. I never knew that. And the fact that we just sat together for you know, a couple of days and wrote that documentation. And for me, that was really eye-opening. We thought we had a good team. We had like, everything working and even a, a phone going off. Uh, but <laughs> when everybody's left and you need to transfer it, that's when you see everything that has become legacy. <laughs> And it's really painful because then you see all the problems you live through, all the things you said like, not now, not now, and you're trying to sell it. So I think I was exhausted. I'm, I, it took me about three months to get in my regular period of sleeping habits again. And um, one of my downsides, my upside is that I really have a lot of empathy for people, and it's also my downfall, because I wanted to shield the team from doing too much long hours, so I did them myself. But it wasn't actually the smartest thing to do afterwards. But what do you do? You can't hire people, there's no money, you wanna keep the same people, because if they leave, you have a bigger problem, so, Yes, exhausted, but you know, my colleagues weren't too happy about it, but I said, like, this is the end, and we ended up. This is where I joined Sneak. 
I didn't even know DevSecOps was a big thing. I've been so focused for four years on my company that you know that was just one of the things happening to the industry, but it wasn't that important. But I learned that it was a nice, uh, big thing happening, and you know they they have been so helpful to to have me join them. So starting at the security landscape, one thing that completely I saw is that. When you've seen Dev and Ops and make becoming DevOps, and now you see Dev and Ops with security, there's this same level of distrust that was before between Dev and Ops. And it, it's, it's interesting to see that um, this is uh, a repeating thing uh, going in uh, companies. The notion of control, like ops used to be all about control. You cannot change something, you cannot do something. And now security was in that same thing. You cannot do this, you cannot do that. This control feeling uh, is going away. This made me think about when you have a CI pipeline, because you know part of the product we're selling is scanning images vulnerabilities. Is this actually increasing our trust in the, in the security? And I found out this is more about the confidence. If there's no notification with one or two messages, then it goes away. But, so it's this confidence if we can get the number away and there's nothing happened, we have this notion that it's becoming secure and we build the confidence by how often you hit something, but we're not really addressing the issue of the trust and knowing for certain that something is secure. If you look at it in a different way, is that if your CI pipeline is fixed, and the more you add to your CI pipeline, the more the process is fixed. I saw a presentation from a guy at SAP, and he said, like, you know, before we had like this 60 things to do before a release, um, and it was like a whole checklist, and now it isn't there anymore. They put it uh, in their CI pipeline. But then I've also seen at places where the CI pipeline became, you can't do this because it doesn't pass on our CI pipeline. And sometimes you wonder whether the established process is the one that has the most freedom of doing it right. So this dogma of the pipeline, the pipeline, the pipeline is something that I found fascinating. Um, and it often comes up about the perspective you have around looking at things where, you know, well, devs don't do this, sec don't do that, ops doesn't do that. I'm now in DevRel and I don't think I know anything about you know, technology because I, I talk to people. So it's like always this mantra of, of uh, looking at things. Um, I learned that as an engineer, I was risk averse. And I'm also risk averse in conversations. So I would kind of ease things out and being empathic. So it's something I learned as well that is not always a good thing. I also found that these best practices uh, yeah, it's really hard. Um, who does uh, get uh, commit reviews? Raise your hand. Did you ready? Okay. So, for a conference, they had like this GitHub repo, and I changed my name because it was spelled wrong. And immediately I get them, you didn't follow the process. You didn't follow the process. It's like, but I will take ownership if it fails, and don't you trust me to judge whether that was something, I, you know, it's changing two letters, right? Um, and it gives this false feeling where we're doing these practices because we don't trust the other, or we don't trust them so ourselves, I get that, but maybe it's masking the, the trust issue and the real pain is not having the conversations you need to have. When we ended our company, I saw so many discussions come up again 
of discussions we only half discussed while being at the company. All these frustrations, all these things the other didn't do, but we kind of hoped he was doing. So these, all these painful things come up. And there is a cost of not trusting people. And I'm not saying CI, CD is a bad thing, but you really have to see through it and dig into the real pain. Are you doing the check-in and the build pipeline because you don't trust the other person? Or you're just doing it to, you know, to have a good process? And that is crucial to think about why you're doing that stuff. So coming back to the trust issue, and I've, you know, I've I've looked at it in many ways that I could. Um, do you trust your salesperson to do the right thing? Do you trust your marketing person to do the right thing? And the trust is from the description I found, um, we tend to think a lot about competence in trust. Um, well, this, the deaf people don't know anything about security says the security person. The, the deaf person says, security doesn't know anything about coding, but you know, it's not their job. It's not the competence they know best, but we judge them by not having the same competence we have and the levels we expect from that person. You can be competent at your job, but completely be unreliable not show up at the meeting that you're supposed to show up at, not being there on time, doing something, but in the weekend that nobody's around. So reliability is part of being at the trust center. And then the sincerity is, do you do as your words say? Like, I personally struggled with a person that we needed to fire, and it's not, obviously, not a happy thing to do. And I struggled with that as a human to fire somebody else because that's his income, that's his job. But then somebody said to me, if you're not firing that person, that is totally unfair to the others in the company. So you say you care about them as well, but you're not sincere in your actions when you're protecting that one person. Yes, you can like, think about it, but where's your sincerity in your actions? And then do you care? Like, I wonder sometimes, imagine the CI pipeline has a fire alarm and has to leave the building and you would do the same process manually, would people do the same process? Will they still care? Like I found out when our desks had the power to deploy directly to Amazon Lambda, <laughs> they skipped like the build system, just go deploy, you know, that's fine. So even though they were doing that and every of those motions, do they care about the thing that we're trying to do? And all of these things build upon the trust. Um, and it shows at different places. But we often reflect upon how the others like, can trust us. But we have a job to do of making ourselves trustworthy. That could be on the same things. Like, you can be competent. It's an easy way. Like, yeah, I know this. I got this. But are you sincere? Are you reliable? And do you care? Because you can do all three and not care about the right thing to do. In my context of company, I had to evaluate open source libraries. What do you, trust? What do, you do to trust in open source libraries? And of course, a, a tooling company would say, we run a check against the database and whether there's a vulnerability, yes or no. But it's a lot more complicated. 
We look at the competence. Some people look at the code on GitHub. Some look at the competence by the fact that he already did some other projects. How, the sincerity could be checked about, are they open for pull requests? Yes, they have a code of conduct, but are they following it? Yes or no? Do they merge my pull request? Do they care? So all these signals exist also on how you look at an open source model. The same in your pipeline. The same in your services as I explained before, like do you trust somebody else by looking at the same stuff? So the, the, the confidence, yes, Amazon is up, so they're competent, they're reliable, but do they care? Maybe if you have that need to have that feature that they don't want to do because it's very niche, they don't care. You have to go to somewhere else. So you always have to find a balance between all the different uh, things. DevSecOps working together. Um, this feeling of control that they say, well, you know, we don't want to control the devs. We don't want to control the devs. We just want to educate them, competence. Uh, we want to be um, sincere. Yes, we'll be at explaining things and, you know, show them and so on. But do they care? And when I ask, like, why does it, I ask to a security person, how do you convince a dev that he wants to build security in? They all talk about the shared responsibility, but they never look at the reason why that person would care. You can care, make them care with a stick, but that's forced care. Like, why would they care? One way is appealing that they can be, become a better programmer because by looking at security, sometimes the architecture of the application improves. So there's a different way of looking at these uh, incentives. And then, just like our startup builds the trust in the market with the little things like the documentation, like the support, that's how we gain the trust uh, to do stuff as well. And then as a manager, I explain no, leading as you think and walk and be trustworthy. That's also quite important. And then even with the team, like, do you trust the others of the team? Or just happily sitting together, pushing code in the pipeline? Like, make that reflection now. Do I trust the people that I work on a day-to-day -day basis with? And if not, look at the four things where you can improve. Do you want to become more competent? Do you want to see what you're doing? Do you care? Maybe if you don't care, you're in the wrong job. It's possible. And then, on that personal note, think very much about yourself. Because when they did like uh, this a uh, poll about how trustworthy do you think the other group is and so on. People always think of themselves more trustworthy than the others think of you. So even if you think you're the most, per they will tell you things like, yeah, but you know, in that meeting, that wasn't right, what you said. So self-reflect on that. Have those real conversations about trusting people, working together, because the cost of distrust is just so high, and if you're building all this stuff to control and make sure that these things don't happen, make sure we're having the right conversations there. Some homework, um, some books to read. Um, uh, the Tin Book of Trust is really a thin book, but it puts it quite eloquently. There's a new one coming up, Agile Conversations. Um, and the whole book is about, I meant to say A, I had this conversation, but the other perceived it completely different. And so they, they kind of train you to reevaluate what you do, your actions, and not just Nothing about that, but what do you do? How do you 
build a trust. Like if you go into a meeting saying, well, anything will say, I don't care, I want this architecture. That, that's not listening, right? Uh, and it happens so often, people are set into a meeting with their mind how things have to go. But then when you have the meaningful conversation, it turns out uh, way better. So for your head, <laughs> it's a little bit nerdy, but they have like a lot of, uh, the, the book is trying to optimize for maximum bandwidth of transfer of, uh, not data, but intent. Uh, and they have um, interesting ways of building that, like you, you can say no in a meeting, uh, so they have the ceremonies, and if everybody has to uh, follow the core protocols, as I see it, to communicate, there's a lot of fluffy stuff and sentiment that goes away, and you, you get more to the essence. But obviously, it's not only on the individual, the team, but also the manager. So that's kind of the fourth book, uh, leading people, building that trust, uh, building that group uh, to, to become together. And then last bonus is this, uh, from the Agile conver uh, conversation is written by these two people that have like a Agile podcast, which talks about more about uh, these things. So tools, maybe 5% culture, all the rest keep playing that same drum. I sorry, I don't think we solved it in the last uh, 10 years of DevOps. Um, and that's my talk. How are we doing on time? Yeah. Um, thanks, Patrick. I think we've got time for some questions. Um, I think that we've got 10 minutes. Am I about right this time? Uh, uh, so anyone would like to throw out some questions? Have we got portable mics, or are we doing the mics at the front? Yeah, so uh, we need to take the questions at the front, if you've got questions, Patrick. Or you can find me later somewhere at the conference. I'll be staying the next two days. Uh, I, I understand this uh, might be a little bit strange for you to absorb. I, I just want to make you think. Think first broader the company. It's not just DevOps. And then introspect again on a, have you actually achieved DevOps as a collaboration aspect is very important. So. Right. I'm going to say off to beers or one question. Yeah. 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 Hi, I was interested on when you said about you found the right the people with potential, no, maybe with the skills, but with potential. How do you do that? I mean, it's interesting. Uh, well, I, I, the question is about how do you find people with potential and not just uh, about the tech skills. Um, I think we, what worked for us, was just saying that we weren't looking for specific tool sets. So this broadened up the spectrum of people applying for the jobs, and then we could just have that conversation. Uh, and often they would have an interest in retooling, rethinking their spectrum. And uh, we, we wouldn't, even though they might have been senior, but in a different stack, we didn't care about that. We, 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 we discussed how their experience, what they did, how they did it in this stack, and then part of our offering was that they would be able to learn the new stack from the other engineers who were already knew, uh, knew it. So we were just open about it uh, from that perspective. Any other questions? I guess um, I, I've got a question that I'd like to put to you. It sounds like you're saying to us that uh, the fundamental point behind DevOps was um, people crossing a barrier, crossing a silo barrier in an organization. It wasn't really about the CICD pipeline. It, it was about that barrier. And now we've added SEC into the equation a lot. Um, and you're putting out, well, why didn't we add sales and marketing and things? So, so, so it's kind of hard to think of DevOps describing us crossing all the barriers in an organization. What should we be calling this and what should the movement now be if it's, uh, if it's gone you know, to every single silo in the organization now? Um, so the 
Yeah, <laughs> I think historically, I would just call it agile. <laughs> um, but historically, I went to speak at a lot of agile conferences, and they just weren't interested in the part beyond the dev. The business part they would be would have been interested in, but they weren't that interested at that time in the operational side or the production side. Uh, I actually I hoped at the time that one day we would have shared conferences, but it's happening here, for example. But it's also requiring separate conversations, and it it has created a bubble in some way that people can be in the DevOps group. And, um, but frankly, I don't care about too much about what word we use. I have no stock options in DevOps, or it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, I think I, one day on 1st of April, I joke, let's re rephrase like DevOps to something else. And then so all the marketing screaming, like, OK, let's rephrase all the marketing material. But it's. The name isn't that important. I, I think, um, from my perspective, the industry has said like DevOps is, is the pipeline. It wasn't the intention. But then you could say Agile didn't have the intention that Agile was Scrum, and ITIL was the help desk system. So that's just how history goes uh, from it. I do believe whatever is the next thing or comes around will build on this so that we still kind of changed uh, the reasoning and helped that build up. But what, whatever is in the name. I, I think the, the importance of the name in the beginning was about finding similar voices under a label where you can find them. But after that, it, it didn't matter that much anymore. So. Okay. Any more questions out there? Thanks, everyone. Thank uh, you. Go and join the uh, yeah.